Welcome to Life Lab Notes, where we review and compare our notes about life, what we have in common, what makes humans tick, and how we can keep from blowing up the lab. My father-in-law, Jerry Ward, wrote a memoir chronicling one of his careers. It has so many fascinating, thought-provoking details told in his own no-big-deal style. Since it actually is a big deal, we decided to share some of it with you in the hopes that you'll see yourself somewhere in this story. We present How to Fly a Jet and Other Life Lessons. When I entered DePaul University in the late summer of 1952, the Korean War, it was not a police action, as Truman called it, was still raging. Those are the words of Jerry Ward, read by his son, Phil Ward. I joined the Air Force ROTC unit at DePaul, which meant that upon graduation, I would be commissioned a second lieutenant and would soon receive my orders to report for active duty. Now, right away, we're going to seem to break from our main story, but this is a story about dreams and leaving your comfort zone to chase after them. In the fall of 53, I espied a comely lass in my biology class. With a bit of effort, I found that her name was Gail Loomis from Kansas City. She was a freshman and a Delta Gamma. A couple weeks later, my folks were visiting for parents' weekend. While walking back from the football game, I noticed Gail ahead of us, pointed her out to my folks, and said I was thinking of asking her for a date. My dad said, You better get on it or it might be too late. That's the voice of Jerry Ward, who was lovingly tricked into quoting his dad's excellent advice. So I screwed up my courage, asked her for a date. To my relief, she said yes. More dates followed, and soon we were an item. In the spring of 54, we were pinned, and in December of 55, we were engaged. Gail's folks agreed to bring her to my training base in late June after she graduated, and we would be married in the base chapel. While waiting for his orders, Jerry had one more summer to work in one of the two Del Monte canning plants in his hometown of Rochelle, Illinois, something he had done every summer through high school and college. Summer stretched into fall, the canning season ended, and still no orders. Jerry began working for the Rochelle Gas Company to make a little more money and driving to DePauw nearly every weekend to be with Gail at school. One day, Dad's Argosy magazine arrived. Pictured on the front was the Air Force's newest and hottest fighter, the sleek-looking F-104 Starfighter. The article was titled, Missile with a Man in It. The little fighter was capable of Mach 2, twice the speed of sound, in level flight. As I devoured the article, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be something wouldn't to fly, be something this, to fly, be something this, plane? To fly this plane? Finally, my orders arrived. I was to report to Lackland Air Force Base for officers' pre-flight training between December 5th and 7th. It was a strange and somewhat lonely feeling driving away from my home of 22 years, striking out on my own. I drove to Texas by way of DePauw, where Gail and I bid a tearful farewell, knowing we would not see each other again for over six months. I drove through the gates at Lackland Air Force Base the afternoon of December 7, 1956, my 22nd birthday. I was now an active duty member of the United States Air Force. This meant paperwork, lots of it along with intensive physical exams, purchasing uniforms, and being indoctrinated to Air Force life. The first week in January, our training base assignments came through. The first phase of becoming a pilot was called primary flight training. At that time, the Air Force farmed out this phase to civilian flying schools located in several smaller communities around the country. I was assigned to Bainbridge Air Base in Bainbridge, Georgia, a small town in the southwest corner of the state, about 30 miles northwest of Tallahassee. I arrived there the second week of January. I filled out the requisite forms at HQ, received verbal and written instructions, and was assigned my quarters. I was now a member of primary flight training class 58H, number no pilot forgets. 
Reporting to the flight line for my first day of training, I was introduced along with four other students to Mr. Patterson, our instructor. Pat was a World War II vet, as were most of the instructors, had flown B-17s in Europe and was one of the nicest men you'd ever meet. He introduced all of us to our first trainer, the T-34. This was a small, single-engine, propeller-driven, fully acrobatic plane, the Air Force's initial primary flight trainer at contract pilot training air bases across the southern United States. We were to receive 50 hours in the T-34. This consisted largely of the basics of flying, acrobatics, communications, emergency procedures, and familiarization with the area. One of the first orders of business was the blindfold cockpit check. We learned where every switch, handle, lever, and circuit breaker was, and then had to touch them all and identify them while blindfolded. This was standard procedure with every plane I flew. Pat showed us the walk-around visual inspection of the plane. I settled into the front cockpit while Pat took the rear seat. As I strapped myself in, Pat gave me one of the best pieces of advice I would receive. He said to remember that I wasn't strapping myself to the plane. I was strapping the plane to me. I was the boss. Jerry trained in the piston engine T-34 and T-28 propeller planes. Flying and aerobatic skills, cross-country navigation, omnidirectional radio codes, instrument flying. We would fly by reference to our instruments only. This was to prepare us to cope with difficult weather conditions if and when they should occur. The instructor was in front and the student in back. By pulling forward a curtain called the hood, the student covered the canopy inside and could not see outside except for an occasional sneak peek at the front edge of the hood. Our instrument training started with the instrument takeoff. The instructor would line up the plane with the center of the runway and the student would close the hood, usually followed by a deep breath and a Hail Mary or two. The instructor would shake the control stick and say, you have the plane. The student would shake the stick and reply, I have it. This procedure was standard when pilots transferred control between them. We were told accidents had occurred because each pilot thought the other was flying the plane. Lined up with the runway, I would advance the throttle and keep my directional needle centered through use of the rudder pedals. At takeoff speed, I would pull the stick back, lift off, raise the gear, and climb away from the runway at the proper speed, and by cross-checking my instruments, maintain control. It kept one very busy, but it became somewhat easier with practice. One thought that never completely leaves a pilot's mind is that of a mid-air collision. At a training base with so many planes in the air, it is especially important to keep your head on a swivel. One day, I was blithely tooling along at altitude on instruments when the stick was slapped violently from my hand, yelling, I have it, the instructor threw the plane into a violent maneuver. I was wondering what the hell just happened when he righted the plane and told me to come out from under the hood. In a calm voice, he told me that we had been belly to belly with another plane for a few moments. My closest call. I never saw it happen. The next plane Jerry flew was the T-33. Despite it being one number behind the T-34, it was actually much more advanced, being the trainer version of the F-80 Shooting Star, the Air Force's first operational jet fighter. And Jerry's first jet engine experience. As we students gathered around the straight-winged T-33, we were duly impressed by its size and presence before us. The lieutenant was imparting a book's worth of information as we circled the plane. In turn, we climbed the ladder to peek into the cockpit. Holy smoke! This wasn't our T-28 cockpit looking back at us. We were stunned by the complexity in the switches, gauges, circuit breakers, and handles in abundance. Comparatively, the T-28 was a toy. The blind cockpit tests were getting more complicated. In the T-33, they were to receive 100 hours of formation flying, weather flying, navigation, and getting used to working with and against gravity. Prior to my first flight, I received the flight manual for the plane, a couple of flight suits and boots, and my G-suit. The G-suit was a pair of leggings with a very wide band around the stomach, all of which zipped on. In the leggings and across the stomach were inflatable bladders within the suit, and a hose came out at the waist. When seated, the hose was plugged into a receptacle in the cockpit. When more than a couple of Gs were pulled, air would come through the hose and fill the bladders, which would press against the legs and stomach, helping to keep the blood flowing to the extremities. The more Gs pulled, the more air filled the bladders and pressed on you. We were also taught to tighten our stomachs as much as possible. We experienced this in the air so as to be aware of when we were close to passing out from lack of blood to the brain. 
The G-suit and gritting the stomach helped a lot, but if you pulled enough G's, about six or more, and didn't release stick pressure, you were, you were going to black out. Releasing stick pressure brought you back quickly. It's a strange feeling, but you, you do get used to it and know when to expect it. In March of 1958, Jerry was awarded his wings and Certificate of Aeronautical Rating as Pilot United States Air Force. He was officially a pilot. After 250 hours of piloting planes. Yes, he'd had instructors with him for some of those hours. He was in training mode. But the way to become a pilot is to pilot. We are land dwellers. Our normal state is on the ground. We go right along with gravity, allowing it to keep us safely attached to the ground. Every aspect of a pilot's training is about accomplishing some important task while surviving the event of leaving the ground. The safe, the known, the normal state. Up until 1903, the way to fly was in a hot air balloon or a lighter than air dirigible. That was what the world knew. This normal did not stop the Wright brothers from building and testing gliders, building their own wind tunnel, experimenting with different shapes of wings and rudders, inventing the three-axis control, designing and carving their own wooden propellers, and adding on a gasoline engine, leading to the first manned, powered flight in a heavier-than-air machine, which they brilliantly, perfectly, beautifully called the Flyer. They took what was known, worked with it, tested it, added to it, until in Flyer 2, the Wright brothers had logged over a hundred flights, adding up to about 50 minutes in the air. 50 minutes. But just a year before, there had been none. The way to become a pilot is to pilot. Jerry's memoir would not make a good Hollywood blockbuster because, spoiler alert, it doesn't include hair-raising combat situations, a gruesome murder, or a scandalous sex scandal. This would be a slice-of-life film about a young man pursuing and achieving his dream. I've always been proud of my service to my country and grateful for the confidence and maturity I gained while becoming a fighter pilot. I admit to a lump in my throat whenever the Air Force anthem is played. Memories dim over time. Still, I vividly recall the tingle of anticipation and excitement as I settle into the Starfighter's cockpit and strap her to me, start the airflow and ignition, bring the throttle to idle, the mighty power plant I'm riding rumbles to life, taxi to the runway, line up with the center line. Cleared for takeoff, I push the throttle forward, the F-104 gathers speed rapidly, light the afterburner, the plane eats up the pavement below me, pull back on the stick, the Starfighter leaps from the runway and carries me swiftly into the blue above on another grand adventure. When some guy gives me trouble, it happens now and then. I'm tempted to fight the way little boys fight before they fight like men. That's by bringing up their dads and making them sound as powerful as can be. And I'd say my dad was a jet fighter pilot in the Air Force. Now who wants a piece of me? Life Lab Notes is produced by me, Sylvie Zamora. The Life Lab Notes theme and underscoring for today's episode were created by Phil Ward. And that last song, Tempted to Fight, was written and performed by Phil Ward. Today's episode was written by Jerry Ward and Sylvie Zamora. Mad respect and lots of love to my dad-in-law, who has indeed flown at twice the speed of sound. <laughs>